thank you all for making it here again to the no another episode of It's My Money with Katrina Dixon or The Money Exchange if you're listening to this podcast. Um, I am Katrina Dixon, your It's My Money lady, and I am your personal finance coach, your girl to teach you how to do all things money for personal and for business. And with me today, I have Lawrence Gonzalez, the neighborhood finance guy. What's up, Lawrence? Woo! What's up, everybody? <laughs> Good afternoon, morning, or whatever time that you listen to this podcast or watching this on YouTube, hopefully. Uh, I'm just very happy to be here with the exchangers. I'm going to call you guys a name, the money exchangers, the exchangers <laughs> over here along it. the line. <laughs> it's just a great opportunity to change your life, change your wealth, and also change your mindset. So I'm happy to be here to share my stories or even stories that might be able to help you. Love it. Love it so much. So, you know, I'm always excited and my listeners know when I come across others that like to talk about money as much as I do, that like to educate folks financially so more can be financially astute. And when I came across you, I knew right away I needed to have you on the show. So before we jump into the various different things that we, we want to get across to folks about how they think about money and what they can do, um, similarly to what you and your wife did, talk a little bit about why you are now the neighborhood finance guy. What got you there? Oh, yes. Uh, one, I think we met in uh, Clubhouse in a toxic room. Nah, nah, it was actually probably a positive <laughs> room, but you know, like every time you're in these kind of spaces, when you say something positive, constructive, people kind of like, they shrug it off and just like, boo, run away. I don't like what you just said, which makes no sense. But ultimately it's a good opportunity to become the neighborhood finance guy because I've seen um, financial advisors and typically their, their starting point is if you're not making 250 or 500 K and up, they literally don't share that information with you. They, they don't give you um, the expertise. And in a community, black and brown people that we only have like 5% CFPs for uh, certified financial planners, it was important for me to kind of take whatever I learned and share it across the, the gamut because we need more people in the community to be financial uh, illiterate and also very much happy. And that's why I do what I do. I've started off like a lot of people with a lot of debt. Uh, I had personally on my side, $125,000 worth of student loan debt. My wife had like 30K. So I looked at her like, my goodness, how lucky are you? <laughs> like, so before we ever met, we were struggling with our own personal finance journey, trying to figure it out. And when we, I, on the path of learning, sharing, and also giving back to middle schools, high schools, and whatever, any, any aspect I could do, I did it. And ultimately, I ran into her and I only had at the time I actually looked it up, I only had maybe $100 in my, my checking account at the time. I did have wealth in the back end. I did have a home. But ultimately, I, had, I only had 100 bucks. And to this day, I probably, yeah, as of yesterday, I had 200 bucks. But, I, you know, we progress. Right? We're doing progression right now. Yeah. So ultimately, at this stage, though, we've um, invested a lot and we've shared a lot of, of our own personal financial testimonies and changes. And we have now over $660,000 worth of wealth. So we went from negative 150 uh, in 2012 all the way to 660 uh, as of January 2022. So in about 10 years, we made a radical change. We were actually by this time next year, we'll be millionaires. Wow, I love it. And, and you know, I want to I want us to step through what sort of changes did you need to make to get there? Because um, what I want folks to walk away from this episode with is I can do this too. Maybe it's 675 or whatever the number is, you're a positive now, but um, or, or not, maybe it's greater, but it's more about what were the changes that needed to happen with your mind or the to both of your minds and or the tactical things to get to there. So before we go there, I, you know, so I know you and your wife came together and you talked about having a hundred or $200 and you came together as one. So I know I called you Lawrence Gonzalez when we started, but I know you have a hyphenated, hyphenated name. Tell us a little bit about, so I'm going to tell them, I didn't say it because I didn't want to mispronounce it, but let's talk about that for a little bit because it plays into the story. Yes, uh, we're, I guess at one point I used to be Lawrence Gonzalez, but now my name has changed to Lawrence Delva Gonzalez. I hyphenated with my wife's uh, maiden name. So now our combined household name is Delva Gonzalez. So it is what it is. <laughs> Ultimately, um, I'm Haitian Brazilian by heritage. She's Haitian uh, by heritage, Haitian American. So we've, we've, we know, we know this for a very long time. At least I personally known that I was going to hyphenate my name no matter what. 
because I'm from a family in which uh, my dad left my mom when she was pregnant with me. So it, was, it wasn't even a, like a simple leave. You know, you didn't just leave her. You left her pregnant and forced her to walk home somewhere. It was kind of an insane story. And we shared it all over the, uh, on our podcast uh, before. But ultimately, I never really met him. My Every interaction I ever had with him was maybe twice. It comes down to two times. It was never every positive. It was never anything constructive. And I never felt the need to really um, almost elevate his name, right? Mm-hmm. When I actually met my wife's uh, dad, you have to imagine she has, you know, it's three daughters that he was raising the entire time. You, you're raising three daughters in the 90s and 2000s, you know, like this is a lot of work uh, for any man to undertake because of all the social pressures, all the social media, all the like the toxic uh, environment that they might, you know, go into. It's not just an extension of what their mom poured into to them, which is just um, the class, the the constant responsibility or just the focus uh, on being mature, but it's also the dad that kept the house together through morality, through religion, through, you know, his own faith and his own um, um, hard work. So all three daughters are college graduates, all three daughters. um, One is a chef at a a restaurant or not, not, she moved from a restaurant to like a a hotel chain. So she's a chef there. That's the littlest one. Uh, my 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 wife is the event coordinator for um, who works directly through Facebook, and she runs like a couple of these offices. And the the first daughter also is almost like she does HR um, generalist type of uh, okay. roles, as well as having her own small business, being a uh, fashion boutique. This this is not a normal scenario yeah. <laughs> in which this guy carried them for thirty years, and I think. In my opinion, a man of that stature um, deserves the respect and accolade, and especially in this society where you don't necessarily find a lot of men, um, if their name is not going to be passed through their daughters, it's always kind of like, hey, their daughter's name kind of changed with whoever they marry, so on and so forth. I wanted to do something special for the family and keep that name alive, keep the tradition alive of how her parents really reared them to be great people. And they're great human beings. They're amazing. Um, I'm, I'm like, that mom, then she cooks all the time. Every time she's like, are we going to the, the, I'm like, are we going to the in-laws place? I'm like, am I going to the in-laws place? That's not a question. This is a, a it's a plane ticket. I am there. <laughs> I love it so much. And I love even watching you talk about it. So that sort of speaks to um, still, okay, you did that when you did, but still how important it is to you, even the way you talk about it now. So now um, let's talk about, so the, the folks are listening to you were, you know, let's call it. 150 160 some odd thousand dollars in debt and now you um have a number that you are tracking towards a million a million in that being a number as um having that as your net worth or the combined net worth talk about what did you do differently like what did each of you do differently did you have to sit down and say this is what we want to do and then what were the steps that you did to get to start along the path well, for one, my wife is perfect. I cannot speak against her <laughs> in the court of law. <laughs> like, like, happy like, wife, happy like, wife, hey, happy hey, she wife. She does nothing right. wrong. If anything, is there is a fault, it's with me <laughs> at, at all times. She's actually she off right now and I'm looking around. I need to clean because she's going to come around and kind of check. It doesn't make any sense. But ultimately, like, my wife made it, uh, my job a lot easier just to jokes aside like she was very much uh, welcoming to these ideas of how we're going to get financially astute. She was always trying to figure out better ways as well even in sense where she didn't know all the details, but she was open and inviting to learn. So we learned together, we put together. I would say uh, my journey started off in 2012 um, solo when I was a single bachelor guy living in Tallahassee with my other friends in a four bedroom apartment. And one day, like I kept on getting these resounding con- conversations around people saying that we did not have enough money to invest, right? That was like, ah, we don't have, any- other people have money to invest, we do not. Like people would just keep on saying and saying and saying until one day I'm like, why? And nobody actually knew how to answer that. So I went back to my room. <laughs> I went, to, uh, I, I logged into mint.com, which I just checked over like what my my budget was, what my numbers were. I tracked it for three three weeks, uh, three months. I tracked it three months and I averaged it out. And when I averaged that out, I found out that the food costs I was uh, spending um, on groceries per month turned out to be $340 as one person. I could not figure it out. I wasn't eating lot. Lobster. I wasn't eating no steak. I wasn't eating anything that was important, but yet I was spending $340 as one single human being, which makes no sense in 2012. I, I mean, and then after that, I was like, you know what? I started asking the other guys some numbers, some general numbers, and I, I ran the total tally, and I found out we were spending $2,400 a month on average on food. Wow. 
2,400. So I realized in that point in time, it's like we didn't, it's not like we don't have money, it's that we're mismanaging the money to the, to the maximum degree. Obviously. Absolutely. As yeah. when I, you know, I, I teach that when I talk to people is, uh, is that I oftentimes hear people say, I don't have enough. I don't have enough to budget. I don't have enough to pay. And when you literally sit down the way you're describing with your money and see what's coming in and what's going out, people are are pleasantly surprised because surprise is the, I love to call it the aha moment when on paper, like what? Like I'm spending that much? Like, that so what? It's, it's not, not me. That. It's, it's not, not me. me. It's like, exactly. oh my, it's your numbers. It's like, exactly. not me. Like, I love it. I love it. So now you've had this realization of how much money you're spending on food. Right now you're still single, right? In the story? Yeah. Okay, I'm still single ahead. in that story. I'm still trying to figure it out. Everybody around me is saying it's still impossible. I'm like, well, technically, if we were reading all these nude articles and all these um, other opinion pieces where people are sharing their stories of success, well, then it's not impossible. It's probably improbable. It's a two different words. Impossible means that it'll never happen. Period. It's done. It's a set deal. Improbable means that it's difficult, that it will, it will take a certain level of energy, a certain level of effort, but it's still a possibility in the world that you can do it. So I set out on the mission to prove it to people by just reading information online and finding out the crux of what they call the, um, the financial order of operation. Mm. That's really what it comes down to, the financial order of operation. There's really three things you could ever find in money management or wealth secrets and whatever. You could read as many books as you want. Even the Bible has them as three things. You, yeah. it's, you decrease your expenses, uh, you increase your income, or, and you invest the difference. That's the three things. Mm -hmm. You decrease your expenses, you increase your income, or you invest the difference. And by that, I mean not just decreasing just any and everything, just decrease the stuff that are not giving you any joy. I used to go to happy hour, but I wasn't happy. I was drinking all these drinks that was super, super expensive. I was walking away from the experience like, why did I just do this? Then I, I just cut it out. One day I cut it out, and I thought it was like the world would implode, but it didn't. Yeah. It ended up keeping more money in my pocket. I started doing things I really love to do. Either it'd be, you know, cycling, running, doing more gym stuff. It created an opportunity for me to use my money differently. And yeah. then I find that as the source of money to, to do other things like travel, invest, so on and so forth. On top of that, you just increase your income. You increase your income by, you know, doing just that, doing better work product, finding better jobs. And just over time, that's going to fix itself. But you have to put in the effort to become a, a better version of yourself and ultimately a better version of the career version of yourself. Okay. Ultimately, the final one is the invest. It's like the biggest part is actually the probably the most important. You invest the difference either in yourself, being that you're investing in education, certification, so on and so forth to create more income. You're investing in relationships, you know, either be relationships with yourself. Yet again, a weird thing about like you have to love yourself. You got to love to in order to love somebody else and be in partnership with somebody else and finding somebody to love. Then you invest in the actual market, either it be into a 401k, IRA, so HSA, in small business, whatever it is, you're literally using these three principles. You decrease the, the expenses, you increase the income, and you invest the difference. In the end, I would say that the biggest piece, and you talked about it, and I think you definitely cover it with your money exchange group, <laughs> is that the biggest things that people are not noticing is that our housing is too much, Mm -hmm. Our transportation is too much and our um, food costs are too much. These are the top three categories. Sure, you could cut out a Netflix, that's $10 a month, but there's something to be said about really cutting down how we're living. Some people are buying homes they can't clean because it's too big. <laughs> <laughs> like, let, let's pull back. It's not that serious. <laughs> like, there's some people that are staying in homes that are too big for them. Let's say if you're retiring and you got your mom and dad, they're like, I'm staying in a four or five bedroom home. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, nobody's here. Like you could cut it down to two, 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 and you still be happy. Yeah. And you still kind of like keep more of your money active. On yeah. top of that, people are buying cars that we saw, especially in the pandemic, get parked outside. Mm -hmm. So there's no real reason to have like luxury machines or whatever it is. Just get a car that gets you from point A to point B. Move yeah. the hell on. <laughs> it's not that serious. And finally exactly. is the food. Yeah. The food is way too much. It's sometimes that food interacts with itself in our, um, in our health. And because of that, it costs us more in the back end in our medical expenses. So you see how all that plays together. All of that play, you're exactly right. So now you, Lawrence, you came upon this realization um, pre-marriage, uh, it sounds like. How did, when you met your significant, uh, your wife, um, 
did she already have this like this sort of uh, management of money under wraps when you met her or did you bring this into the relationship and you guys just progressed together in our first date i attacked her with just like what's your credit score now i'm lying <laughs> that's, not, that's not what happened that's not what happened at all some people in their minds they imagine hey he, he's going to talk to her about finance no we just if anything I think our first date, our first real date in my mind, because there's probably some other dates, but in her mind that she counts, I count our first real date when we went to, uh, I believe is David Busters. Mm -hmm. Went to David Busters, we're showing up, we're going to have a good time, and I'm ready to do what I always do, which is whip out the card and just kind of swipe that sucker, let's get in. And then she stopped me and she's like, oh, oh, I know we're coming on this date, I got a coupon, I got a coupon for it. Like in the week, in, in, inside the week, she saw a coupon, she <laughs> saved the coupon, brought it up right there on that Saturday where we we're just having a good time. And it taught me a hundred percent that this is the right woman for me. <laughs> it's not because of the coupon per se, it's because she cared enough to think about us in the long-term sense. And like, even in the long-term being like, even that date, she's like, you know what? I, we don't, we don't have to spend all this money. If there's a coupon that exists, there is no point yeah. to do that. So she There's showed me her hand, whereas a lot yeah. of other people I've dated in the DMV, which is you know, the Washington DC area, a lot of times they're like, hey, if you ain't paying like a hundred dollar like a uh, uh, tab on a restaurant, <clears throat> and, and when the when the when the when the bill comes, they do the turn to the side, <laughs> like get a little weird. <laughs> like, he's like, he's like, not today. And then you find out some girls later on, because I have a lot of homegirls, they'll tell me that, hey, and you know what? He paid and, and I didn't have a good time. I'm like, what? After a hundred dollars? So I'm like, that's a lot of money. And then you had you didn't even have a good time? Like, what is this? So when I found somebody that just really resonated in the sense of like, she didn't care about the money, mm -hmm. it made sense to me that I'm like, I'm ready to spend all of it. And eventually in 2019, wow. we went, we traveled to 12 countries in 14 days. Wow. Like straight up. We just had, a, we we're good. Cause in the end of the day, once you start doing what you love and you tackling all your money issues per se, you're going to create so much extra money for you to do that you can actually do the stuff you truly love to do, being like travel or whatever it is, even if it's just building a business, but you could create that, um, these things. Now, before we go there, because that's amazing. Yes, it um, was. So dope. now she did the coupon. You paid less for Dave and Buster's. But then, you know, you talk about openly, you know, very transparently that you there was some debt. So how did you still, you know, did you coupon a lot more after oh, that? Oh, no, no. After she don't. I don't know. I mean, there's nothing wrong with coupons. Like, like, nothing wrong with the coupons. Like, I, I, try, I try couponing, but I, I was more like the buy one, get one free at Publix kind of guy. <laughs> like, okay, so did, together, I mean, but they, I guess. I guess what I'm trying to get at is you you talk about the amount of debt you are in you talk about where you are now doesn't that doesn't mean debt free but I mean there is some positive financial things going on so um is it you can you give us like one or two things that you all do that got you from point a to point b and c and d so that when people listen to it they're like oh I, I could do that I can try that or I can have that discussion with my significant other to maybe go along this path if that's the path yeah. that you want to go on. I, I love the question. I think it's very important to ask as well. I think for us, I was I always knew in financial information, so I don't like to bombard people with it. So it's more like I like to, hey, if the person wants to talk about it in that moment, I'll, I'm, I'm a dish out. But in yeah. in just randomly, I'm not gonna just pop quiz them. I'm not gonna show, hey, <laughs> hey, what's going on with your finances? But it's more like in a conversation, hey, what are, you know, if we're getting to that point, she asked a question that I could dive a little bit more. And sometimes she asked me just one question, but then she keep asking me other questions. Uh -huh. And then she takes that information and she takes it to dissect it or even share it with her sisters. She talks with them every day for some reason. Yeah. Like, you know them. <laughs> it's kind of weird. <laughs> but ultimately, um, I think the first thing we ended up doing, or I basically told her that HR at our jobs are, are doing us a disservice because they're not telling us all the details. So make sure that you're looking at your benefits, see what's available to you, and make sure you're maximizing your benefits. Being Majority of that being your 401k, 403b, 457bs, uh, which also allows people to have matching contributions. The matching is 100% important because it's 100% free money. Yeah. A lot of times on average, people are leaving anywhere from three grand to five grand a year, period. On I just like free money. free money. It yeah. makes no absolute sense. So that was one of the things I taught her. Another thing I taught her about is like knocking down. I think the first one is uh, your credit card debt being the high interest one. I asked her how much she's paying in interest. A lot of people don't know what that is. She went to look at it. She noticed she was paying 150 in interest. 
And then she was kind of like, even though she was paying the minimum or a little bit more than she needed to, the, the interest was killing her on the back end. So I told her, uh, which is a lot of problems a lot of black and brown communities have, like we tend to give money to other people and then at the same time being taxed on the side uh, with the credit card debt. I'm like, slow down giving money to your mom, slow down giving money to whomever. And it's okay, they will be there, but knock out your debt. So then now you have extra money to give to those people as well. So I think that's one of those things that it comes down to the financial order operation that I talked about. If you do what you need to do, it'll create space for everything that you want to do. Yeah. And sometimes you can't give your money directly to your mom and whoever at the beginning because you, you literally don't have it yet. You need to knock out the, the, the interest fees that are really killing you on the side. That $150, you could be given directly to your mom. Like I think she was giving your mom like just like $50. I'm like, that 150 that, that you knock out at that point, you could give 150 to your mom. And you and it'll be like, you can even give $100 and you keep 50 for yourself. Yeah, <laughs> like in the end right. of the day, it's just managing your money differently and understanding that those principles. And I think finally what we did was kind of eventually we moved together. We moved in together, which is a, you know, it sounds sacrilege out there in these streets, <laughs> but in truth in, in 2021 and, and for millennials, that's probably gonna be the case where people have to start making decisions, smarter decisions. You can't just move in with just anybody. Like, that's exactly. not the game here. Yeah. But also just finding like space in which, let's say I had a second room and my roommate was leaving and she was like, oh shoot, he's leaving that stupid bastard. I'm coming in for the, for the cheaper <laughs> rent. So she ran into it yeah. and we saved money together at that point because she wasn't paying as much for lodging or anything like that. So that creates a little bit more room for us, a little bit more room for her to pay down more of her debt. So she became debt free technically as of like what well, 29 20 I want to say it's 2020 yeah mid 2020 okay. she became completely debt free no credit card debt no student loans no anything so yeah so it sound, if I were to sum up what you said it sounds like um you're saying that one you identified what what sort of expenses was happening and then it was like okay there's some credit card debt let's figure out how to decrease that or pay it in a different way than it had been before. Maybe like you said, minimum, um, the, the minimum balances or a little bit more versus let's like kind of knock that debt out or pay bigger chunks on it. So that the, when, if you do pay interest, you're paying a smaller interest amount. And then you consolidated household expenses. Like that was another way. I mean, you know, people have their opinions about that one way or the other, but for you all, that's what you did in that, th that got you to the place that you are today. So the important thing is because people can do, let's just call the last one, the consolidation, but yet <laughs> for the one person that no longer has the rent, that could become spending money for them. So, um, yeah. so it looks like she bought into, okay, we're going to consolidate and then I'm going to use what I would have paid for household expenses, potentially into the household, but then yet take care of debt versus now this becomes more spending money. So it sounds like that's where she landed when she did yeah. that consolidation. And part of it too, we did get engaged. So it's kind of like the buy-in was already in, like we're already going down that path, you know, yeah. so it wasn't just kind of an ad hoc, you know, you got a girlfriend for like two weeks and like, hey, let's move in together, let's do yeah. this. Like, yeah. And I think one of the things I forgot to say is that we did a, we meal prep and I think we still meal prep. The idea and the fundamentals are there. Our grand, our grandparents did all that all the time. They always meal prepped. I'm not quite sure how we walked away from it to the point where somebody else comes in and gentrifies the terms and, <laughs> and now they call it meal prepping. We've yeah. always been meal prepping. It's, okay. There's food at home. Yeah. So you don't necessarily have to spend all your money buying food outside and buying for those things. You literally buy food at home. And if you're in one of those big cities that do like a restaurant week, that's when you could kind of check out some of those super expensive restaurants at a deep discount. Kind of like DC has a restaurant re coming up and we're, you know, hey, we could get like a three course meal, five course meal sometimes at a price of 30 bucks uh, per person. Mm. You literally can't beat that if you kind of set it up in a certain way. Exactly. But it, that I think that also goes back to budgeting, right? So if, you know, you have that opportunity for a lesser meal at a place that you you probably don't frequent, but you would like to try out every now and then. And then if that's within your budget, that makes sense the time to do it at that point. So I always tell people, it always goes back to the budgeting and you can call it sp spending plan. You can call it a uh, money meeting, whatever you want, but you have to sit down and look at what you have coming in and what you have coming out, going out. And then you can see the room or the cushion for the other things that you may like to do that aren't regular things that you do. So um, let, I did. I did have another question for you. So, 
when we talk about this, oftentimes people will say, well, maybe that's easy for you. That's easy for you, Mr. Uh, neighborhood finance guy. But talk about at least one thing that didn't go well or that you, you did one way and you had to change because it wasn't contributing to your overall goal. Because it happened. My life didn't go well. What's up with y'all? Five <laughs> like, seconds. My life did not go well. <laughs> What's going on? Like, like I and was finding, yeah. I, like, I, we did this, we did that, we did that. Oh, and, oh yeah. Oh, like, it, it's always the highlight reel that people are more, like, focused yes. on. But they forget, like, I started off right out of college making $23,000 before tax. Like, that's the only job I could pick up. That's the only job I, that was available for me if I had to pick it up. And the, the weirdest part about that, the state of Florida pays monthly. So they'll drop a check like right in that month and that you got to make $1,000 work for the entire month. So in that struggle, in that moment, I learned not necessarily just like turn ex, um, externally just to complain. I turn internally and say, you know, what can I make it happen with $1,000? I grew up um, in Haiti where places we didn't have water, running water. We had roving electricity. I remember when Texas just lost electricity. They were panicking for, for you know, yeah, it's, it's true. They panicked for a good, good amount of time. I'm not going to, you know, mess with the Texas people. But we had that my entire life growing up. Like it was roving electricity. What's up with y'all? Like this is this is so I've learned all these lessons watching my grandmother that never made more than 16k a year. I watched her take care of maybe what six people in the house, well six adults, and then a, a myriad of kids. Like we made things work, and it's not to say that life is not difficult, it's not hard. But I tried to remember those lessons of my grandmother and how she kind of made it happen, and try to. It's like if she never made that much money, and she never made 23k. Why can one person, me, figure out how to make everything work without any, no, no other liabilities, no other person? So I had to double down and say, you know what? I get it. I'm going to listen to somebody's story. It might be different. There might be further along the journey. But I have to kind of take the lessons that they learned and actually apply it for myself in the moment. What can I do? Yeah. So not what you can't do. Yeah. Think about what you can do, that possibility. What can I figure out? What can I learn? There was an article I read once, and it was the very beginning, where there was like a group of sisters. It was like three or four of them that they graduated with student loan debt. The older sister kind of corralled the last four. Uh, the last, yeah, it might have been five or something. It was an insane amount of sisters. But they, he, she corralled them into living in one space, whereas they kind of shared rent, whatever it was, and they all knocked out all their student loans because they didn't have to pay as much. Why? Because they figured it out. They didn't have to be rich, but they had to be resourceful. They had to step back and figure out what works for them. So I think they ended up tackling one person's student loan at a time. Like it's like, yeah, they paid the minimum, but they just like as sisters, they piled money into it. Knock that person out, knock that person out, knock that person out. And then as they kind of got knocked out, it, as, you know, I guess I was gonna say they got knocked up, but they ended up <laughs> with, with, with their husbands of their own and they kind of, you know, basically branched out, buy homes, so on and so forth. So it was possible. I love it. I love there that. There was so, so that, much greatness out there. Yeah, so now if you had to uh, leave the listeners with a tip, so think about folks that are listening, would love to be in the financial position that you've stated that you and your wife are in. How, what would the, what's the, let's say two, what are two steps that you, or two things or two tips that you would give them to start their journey or to keep them motivated along their journey? Ooh, that's a, another good question. There's so many ways to tackle this. <laughs> I would say the two steps is to be healed. Be healed in the sense of your mind. Because if you're living in a, in a realm of limiting belief um, and negative mindset and always kind of downing stuff or always never solving something, mm -hmm. you have to remember that your mind was constructed to solve problems. It's not constructed just to live in them. So I would say cut off, turn off the news, turn off toxic like media, like the shade room or something like that, not to, you know, shade on them but it's yeah. basically cut out these things to create space in your mind so your mind can start solving again because that's the only way you're going to get out of this um the second thing is to always kind of stay take action not just listen to other people i think part of it is you know they're going to be listening to you in the podcast they're going to be listening to your advice they're going to get all this information from so many sources but taking action means that you're stepping beyond the, just listening you're not just saying, mm, that was a good idea and whatever, whatever. That, that, was, that was nice. I would say even share it with other people because mm -hmm. it's going to force you to kind of commit to those things that you just listened to. Yeah. <laughs> so like share it, you know, like we typically share all the negative stuff because it's the quickest thing to share. Ha ha, this celebrity is falling apart. Like she's, she's on drugs or he's, he's yeah. having a tantrum or whatever. Ha ha. 
But it's harder to say that, well, I've shared this thing that is so positive that the only thing I can do is actually kind of live up to it. Mm. Like, or I could change. So those are two things I could say. And it sounds kind of ridiculous. It has no real oh, dollar great. value, yeah. but it actually going to build so much wealth in your life that you're going to end up being happy for it. Exactly right. And you know what? You you made me think of a point when you with, with what you just ended with, and that is wealth is defined differently by different people, right? And for some, wealth is having time, having enough finances that gives them time where not where they're not trading um, their time for money. And wealth is having options. Wealth is not being, you know, old, like not being able to have self-care. So it's defined in so many different ways. So I love how the tips that you gave, although you're the neighborhood finance guy, the tips that you gave have nothing to do with that, with um, finances per se, but they contribute to you being able to do all the other things that you mentioned to see your finances grow. So I think it's tied yeah. it in really well. Oh, I was going to say something even simpler, like drink water and, and go to sleep on time. <laughs> like, like, they were like, what? I, I came here for finances. I'm like, the truth, we don't drink enough water and we don't sleep on time. Like, it's just, like, how can you think clearly and do anything if you're not taking care of you? Yes. They talk the, the bottom, the, what I hear you saying over and over again with all you're saying, everything ties back together. So if you don't sleep well, then you can't think you're not thinking right in order or you're too tired to, to, to execute on the things that you even heard. So it's all, it's all together. So um, again, I appreciate you being here. I appreciate you, the neighborhood fine. Oh, before I go, the neighborhood finance guy, how did that name come about? The neighborhood finance guy, and that's actually for the nerds. It's an inside joke. It's called um, basically the Sp Spider Man goes by the, the acronym the the neighborhood Spider Man. The yeah. idea that he works in a local sense, like he's a person that works for the people on the ground. So he's not tackling the big stuff. He's not big. He's not out there. He's not doing all the the heavy labor per mm -hmm. se. But he's really making an impact in his community on a day to day basis. So if I think of like like the Dave Ramsey's as the the cosmic <laughs> the superhero the Avengers out there doing their thing. I'm more of the bottom guy that that really teaches uh, the neighborhood how to figure out how to be better to themselves and just be happier. Because there's yeah. nothing more important in wealth than just your happiness in the end. It's not a dollar thing. It really comes down to you figuring out the goals that you want um, to live by, your plans, your objective. And it could be as simple as, I just want to wake up in the morning and drink coffee and, and a croissant. Like, <laughs> that's the dream. You know what I'm saying? Or I, I want to just read a book next to the uh, the fire. I'm like, okay, all right, dude, that's your dream. Like, some people, do it, right? like, these do things, it. these are just simple dreams of waking up. And that's what's important. And if yeah. we, we're not living by those things, the community doesn't heal. It doesn't, we're not happy in a community. So it's not the way it's supposed to be. I love it. I love it so much. So, you know, I'm sure everybody here enjoyed what they've heard and you gave them some tips and tools uh, in the, in, um, so that they can then, again, like I said, continue along their financial journey or start their journey to wealth. Where can they find you if they're interested for uh, looking you up? I know I'll put it in the show notes, but go ahead and verbally tell them. Oh, you can definitely find me online being toxic by spreading positive stuff <laughs> for some reason. But I'm on IG. I'm on the website uh, called the uh, www.theneighborhoodfinanceguy. IG, the same name, the entire name all the way through those spaces, the neighborhood finance guy. Do not mess it up. <laughs> like, it's like the words are different, like, but do not mess it up. And on top of that, we're also me and two other ladies that do um, basically a financial storytelling um, in our blog called The Financial Griot where we talk about our experience as first generations or even people that grew up in America figuring out you know, how to become wealthy, either through helping small businesses scale up, um, showing people that they can travel, enjoy, and also even sharing like some real deep financial literacy stuff uh -huh. you know, that scares people sometimes, but we get into it sometimes and we have a great time doing it. And it's just a lot of fun. I love it, I love it. So you heard it here. Um, Lawrence Gonzalez as the neighborhood finance guy. If you enjoyed what you heard, make sure you leave a comment below if you're watching us on YouTube or if you're listening to us, give us a comment wherever, whatever platform you're listening to us on. And then give us a thumb up, thumbs up. And don't forget, subscribe to the show so you'll be notified when all of the episodes are released. Thank you again for being here on the Money Exchange and It's My Money with Katrina Dixon. Okay.